Now I would like to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Jason Huxima. Dr. Huxima received his PhD in ecology from the University of California at Davis in 2002. And then he did postdoc research at the University of California at Santa Cruz and also at Duke University before joining the University of Mississippi faculty in 2007. Dr. Huxima is now a professor of biology at Old Miss where he teaches courses on microbes, birds, of course, that's the ornithology course, fungi, and he uh, also teaches advanced statistic courses and coevolution. His lab studies species interactions ranging from interactions between trees and symbiotic root fungi and uh, interactions between suites of birds that are using the temporary agricultural wetlands, basically any kind of species interaction you might imagine. Jason is also active in, the lo in local bird conservation and local ornithology. He is the president of the Mississippi-based nonprofit Delta Wind Birds. And he is also vice president of the Mississippi Ornithological Society. And he serves on the Mississippi Bird Records Committee as well. Orleans Audubon members would be interested in hearing about many of Dr. Hoxima's research projects including mannequin evolution and lecking behaviors. But tonight, he's gonna to talk to us about his work closer to home, the Delta Wind Birds program, which he spearheads. Delta Wind Birds works with private landowners to create and protect wetland habitat for migratory water birds. So I'll now turn you over to Jason for more details about this wonderful conservation project. Uh, Dr. Hoxima, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Sure. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. I appreciate the invitation to be here, and uh, thanks for that very nice introduction. I'm really glad to see all of you here this evening. Uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen so I can show you some slides while I talk. <clears throat> um, so... I want to start by defining a bit of vocabulary. Uh, where I live, it's pretty common for organizations to be called Delta something, Delta Wildlife, Delta Farm, Delta Council, uh, Delta Land Trust. There are a lot of organizations that start with Delta, but Windbird often trips people up and they're not really sure what to make of that. And I wanted to make, make sure we we're on the same page that Windbird, um, and this is probably a term that's familiar to most of you, but uh, maybe not. It's really what I would define as a poetic synonym for a shorebird. And we'll talk about what is a shorebird in a minute. Um, but it comes from, this term comes from a quote from Peter Matheson, the naturalist who wrote a book about these birds that was first published, I believe, in the late 1960s. And he said, uh, this about them, the restlessness of shorebirds, their kinship with the distance and swift seasons, the wistful signal of their voices down the long coastlines of the world make them, for me, the most affecting of wild creatures. I think of them as birds of the wind, as wind birds. And I really like that, and I, I think those of us who love these birds appreciate that sentiment, and um, it's a bit of a term of endearment for, for those birds. Um, this is some of the cast of characters, and notice that it doesn't include here things like herons and egrets uh, and spoonbills. Those are amazing birds, and they often are hanging around near the same kinds of habitats, but when we say shorebird, we don't just mean, you know, any kind of long-legged bird that's in the water or near the water. This is a group of birds uh, that is united in some ways by their their small stature. Uh, they're fairly long and slim bills uh, that they use to probe different aspects of this habitat. And then in a lot of cases, their habit of, of spending time in shallow water or mudflats and probing those habitats for their uh, favorite food. Now, they differ from each other in a lot of ways, the different species. So you have the American avocet at the top right, which is one of the largest ones in, that we have. It's, I think it's the largest shorebird in North America. It has a, a beautiful, graceful shape with an upturned bill that they sweep back and forth across the water. And if you've ever seen a 
a flock of avocets feeding together. It's really a sight to, to behold where they move across a pond and coordinate and uh, fashion and, and sweep for small invertebrates uh, that they uh, are scooping up out of the water. The black neck stilt is pretty large as well, but has a straight bill uh, that they use more for picking and not sweeping uh, and getting different uh, invertebrate prey. Uh, the Wilson snipe has a very large bill to body size ratio, and um, it's a pretty stocky bird. Uh, they have reasonably long legs, but um, they're a chunky bird with a uh, short tail and um, a big head, kind of like a dowager, and a big long bill that they use to probe into soft mud. And we get a lot of uh, snipe here in Mississippi in the winter in, the, in wet, muddy fields. Um, killdeer, or around here I hear it called killdee quite a lot, uh, is maybe the most familiar shorebird, and it's in the plover uh, family, and uh, that group of birds, they, they have sort of a stubby tubular shaped bill, and the killdeer, as you may know, they, they commonly nest in gravel uh, parking lots or baseball diamonds. It's kind of a miracle that they are so successful as a species, um, given how much risk they seem to take with the, where they put their eggs, but they're doing just fine uh, for sure. And uh, uh, the American woodcock on the bottom left is perhaps one of the biggest exceptions to the shorebirds in terms of its ecology and behavior in that it really prefers upland areas uh, near woodlands where there's open fields, woodlands, and creek bottoms, and, and it sort of moves among across the boundaries among those three habitats. Um, we love it up here in northern Mississippi because it's it's one of the the shorebirds that we can really feature to people as a as an exciting uh, interesting bird because here uh, is this true in Louisiana as well that they they start um, uh, displaying in like late uh, in February and um, they the males uh, find an, a little open area in, in fields and start doing their painting uh, in the evenings and and then do their aerial Twitter display up in the air, really high up in the air uh, while the females watch. And they're, uh, I don't know how many females are actually watching or if they're just mostly practicing because a lot of those birds don't end up nesting here. They do that while they're presumably preparing to head further north, um, but some of them do stay and nest. And it's great to be able to bring people out evenings in February or early March to see that display. Um, Wilson's phalarope is fairly famous among ornithologists and birders for uh, having reverse sex dimorphism where the, the males are not the brighter uh, sex that, that gets to take off after the uh, eggs are laid in a lot of cases. In fact, the females, uh, which is shown there, are uh, phalaropes are more brightly colored. Uh, they have less of a role in, in raising the young and um, they're a real treat to see. They're just beautifully subtly colored and I always love to uh, come across them during migration. And then the, the yellow legs on the bottom right are among my favorites also, especially lesser yellow legs has so much personality. They, we get them a lot in our research fields, which I'll tell you about more in a minute. And they, they spend a lot of time uh, hopping around and chasing each other and making a lot of different kinds of calls, uh, communicating with each other and, um, really seem to be, um, have a lot of character and I always love seeing them come through. Uh, they're also still hunted in some places and their populations are declining. Um, and uh, I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, one of the most impressive aspects of shorebirds and one of the reasons I love them is that they have really impressive migratory journeys that they go through. Um, there are exceptions, but most of them have really impressive migratory, uh, epic, I would say, migrations. And some of them uh, do it differently than others. And so one example is the hop strategy. On the West Coast, you might get a species uh, like a Western sandpiper that is breeding in Northwest Canada and hops down to a bay on the West Coast of Canada, and then maybe to Washington or Oregon, and then maybe to Southern California, or maybe they stop in San Francisco on the way and end up in, in Mexico. Short hops, fairly short. Um, uh, and then there's other species that make much longer what we might call jumps. And sometimes these jumps involve flying, for example, from the Arctic all the way down to Louisiana or Mississippi. Um, and, uh, or sometimes it's even longer. And uh, one example right in the middle of this map would be the Hudsonian godwit, which um, 
stages often in James Bay or on the east coast of, in the far northeast and then hops or jumps all the way to Brazil or even further on their way down to the southern part of South America for the winter. Uh, white rump sandpipers do something similar in the fall and fly all that way. Um, and the physiology of these birds that is required to make those jumps uh, is really remarkable. And I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, but I also want to mention you know, what's happening at these stops. Uh, these stops are really important for their migration and it requires that there's good habitat at each of these stops. Uh, these birds are, are programmed genetically to fly a certain uh, range of distances, but then they need to find food to refuel and they end up spending three, four, five to 10 days or more at each of these stops, fueling up and rebuilding their muscle and their fat especially regaining the weight that they lost during those flights because during those flights they don't stop to eat or drink uh, and they can lose a lot of weight. So they need high quality habitat at each of these stopover sites. Um, I want to highlight what is I think the most impressive migratory bird in the world and it's a shorebird called the bar-tailed godwit uh, which nests in Alaska and for a long time, it was known that most of them spent the winter in New Zealand, but it wasn't clear how they got there, um, whether they stopped in Hawaii or somewhere maybe in, maybe in Korea or Japan or in that part of, of Eastern Asia. Uh, and um, so finally, uh, the technology was available to put GPS trackers on them and uh, a team of scientists captured uh, some of these birds on their nesting grounds in Alaska and strapped little backpacks to them that con contained transmitters where there would be a signal that could be followed remotely uh, while they were migrating. And um, the scientists who did this eagerly watched the signal as these birds took off from Alaska on their fall journey towards New Zealand. And uh, as they approached Hawaii, they didn't even slow down. Uh, we don't know whether they glanced down and thought about it, but uh, they did not stop in Hawaii. They didn't stop anywhere. It turns out they flew roughly nine days, sometimes um, 10 or 11 in some cases, without stopping. And that's how they get to New Zealand. This is about 5,600 miles. They fly roughly 25 miles per hour the whole time. And again, they don't stop to eat or drink. Uh, it's not like an osprey that carries maybe carries a fish along with it uh, to, to eat along the way. Um, we do think that they sleep half of their brain at a time, probably, uh, while they're doing this, although I don't know how many direct measurements there are of that. Uh, that's the, the thought. And uh, it's pretty incredible. The internal physiology that this requires is really remarkable as well. They lose a lot of their, um, uh, the mass of their, of their internal digestive organs uh, in the days leading up to the flight. Um, it shrinks to save weight. And meanwhile, they've put on a lot of weight in muscle and fat. Um, how do they drink water? The water mostly comes from digestion of muscle. The, the fat, of course, has a lot of energy in it, but they digest muscle and that's not, that's not a mistake. It's not like they're, they're atrophying because, of, uh, because they're unhealthy, but that's part of the strategy. That muscle, that the protein when it digests, provides water that they can metabolize. Uh, so there's just a lot of amazing adaptations in these birds that allow them to do it. And you can actually follow this online. There's a, a couple of research groups that track them and you can look at the maps. Um, I, I follow them on Facebook. Um, and there are some great videos about these bar-tailed godwits. So I encourage you to look that up and, and watch them. You can see um, video of them getting trapped and flying and, um, and then hear the scientists talking about it. Um, so another reason though that we're interested in shorebirds is that a lot of their populations are in decline. At least 60% of species are declining currently, we think. Um, some of them are more in trouble than others. Uh, the Eskimo curlew is, um, is extinct uh, almost certainly. The, the piping plover uh, is on the federal endangered species list as is the Hawaiian stilt. Um, Snowy plover and red knot are federally threatened. And then just as an example, in our state of Mississippi, um, our wildlife action plan lists several additional shorebird species uh, that are 
uh, in uh, among the species, species of greatest conservation need. And this is for a wide variety of causes. It, shorebird conservation is complex because they need high quality habitat in their nesting grounds. They need it in their wintering grounds, sometimes as far south as the southern tip of South America. And they don't just spend one their time in one place in the winter. They move within South America at different seasons, different stages of the winter season. And then they need high quality habitat at these stopover sites as well. So there's a lot of different habitat sites that are needed to support their populations and loss of wetlands and degradation of stopover sites is thought to be one of the key uh, uh, problems that is driving decline in shorebird populations. They are also still hunted, as I mentioned earlier, especially in some uh, Caribbean countries and Northern South America and in the Caribbean. Um, and so that's an issue as well. Um, and climate change is having a variety of effects on them. For example, that there's some uh, evidence now that the timing of arrival in the Arctic for some of these migratory birds has been altered. Um, and, and so their arrival, they're arriving when they normally arrive, but the, um, the Arctic has woken up uh, earlier. And so a lot of the, they miss some of the big food um, uh, bursts of, of, of insect food uh, that they should have been there for. So it's complex. Um, here in our region, uh, I'm, we focus our work mostly on the Mississippi River Valley or, sorry, uh, Lower Mississippi River Valley or also called the MAV, the Mississippi Alluvial Valley. And uh, it's estimated that roughly a half a million shorebirds come through this region on migration every year, uh, around 27 different species. And uh, what, uh, uh, what we've seen is that um, when supplemental stopover habitat is provided in this region for these birds, they use it like crazy. So when a farmer, for example, some of you were here before my talk started and we were chatting, when a catfish farmer, for example, uh, drains a catfish pond during September, it becomes almost immediately jammed full of, shore, of migratory shorebirds. Um, and uh, we've seen this in natural habitats as well. Uh, there is some natural habitat left in this region for these birds. Um, Oxbow lakes, for example, in a dry year, especially when they dry down, it exposes many acres of mudflats and shallow water that becomes great habitat for shorebirds, for blueing teal, uh, for wading birds like herons and egrets and spoonbills and storks and, and other birds as well. Um, but uh, the backwaters, the sloughs, the, the um, uh, oxbow lakes that formerly made up a lot of the natural habitat for these birds in this region, their hydrology is not uh, natural in most cases anymore. It's been controlled through flood control measures, infrastructure, draining and straightening, um, uh, uh, well, draining of wetlands, straightening of, of river channels and creeks. And so a lot of the natural shallow water and mudflats that, that historically occurred in this region and supported these birds is not available anymore. And we think this is why they, they flock so readily to provisioned temporary wetland habitat. Um, and we think that in our area here, uh, the best thing we can do for shorebirds is to um, try to deal with this problem of limited stopover habitat, especially in the fall. Um, in the Delta, there's a lot of rain and there tends to be a lot of rain in the spring and that puts a lot of natural water on the landscape. And, and these birds coming through, they, they tend to be able to find habitat, um, uh, plenty of habitat in the spring, but in the fall, it can be very limited when it's been dry, um, which it often is. So we focus on the fall season as well. Um, Delta Windbirds is a nonprofit organization that I helped to found back in 2013. Uh, this was after the Gulf oil spill. Uh, at, and there was a program that some of you may have heard of called the Migratory Bird Habitat Initiative, where the Coast Guard was actually skimming, you know, helping to skim oil off the Gulf and they were able to sell it, which always surprised me to hear. And the, they took the proceeds from those sales, gave it to USDA NRCS, uh, who used it to make bird habitat. And 
um, ostensibly to kind of make up for some of the lost and damaged habitat on the coast. But they were working with farmers and other landowners inland as well. And it was a very successful program documented to work quite well. But we learned that at least in Mississippi, it was going away in 2013. And so we founded our organization to try to replace some of that function to keep raising funds and working with private landowners like catfish farmers and um, crop farmers and others to create temporary shallow water and wet and mud wetland habitat for migratory shorebirds. That was the goal at the beginning. Um, and that's still our primary mission. Um, on, and secondly, um, over the years, we expanded our mission to include research on the benefits of these temporary wetlands, not just for birds, uh, but for other ecosystem services as well. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Um, we have also worked some in the area of protection of natural wetlands, and we focused especially on a really special place called Sky Lake in the central uh, Mississippi Delta, and I'll tell you more about that. And then we have a, an important mission as well on outreach and education, trying to um, make sure people hear about wetlands and their importance for not only these birds, but other kinds of wildlife and getting people outside uh, and all of the benefits that come with that, um, mental health benefits and physical health, uh, and uh, as well as trying to reach communities that haven't traditionally participated in these kinds of activities, uh, conservation and outdoor uh, recreation. Um, and in the process of all of this, also trying to spur economic activity around uh, wildlife appreciation. So some amount of ecotourism in uh, struggling communities in the Mississippi Delta. So I'll say just a little bit more first about our efforts to create habitat on working lands. This is an aerial image of Four Winds Refuge, which is our longest running partnership with a private landowner. This is actually a group of landowners from Jackson, Mississippi, who are duck hunters. And they bought this, this was a, a former catfish farm. And that's a, un, unfortunately a, a, quite a common scenario in the Delta. Over the last few decades, the catfish industry has really declined due to especially competition from uh, uh, Eastern, Eastern Asia. And uh, duck hunters have bought up a lot of these former catfish farms and turned them into recreational properties where they can manage for ducks, but also other wildlife and other kinds of recreation. And these guys are really into it. And we've, we've really grown in our relationship with them. And they've really learned how to make great shorebird habitat. They've figured out how on this mosaic of ponds that used to be a catfish farm, how can they make shorebird habitat, especially during fall? And it's been working really, really well, especially the last few years, these landowners have gotten uh, uh, very excited and much better at doing it than, than when we first started. So I'll show you just a couple of images from that place. Um, this is one of those ponds. Um, this is from pretty early on, but this is what it looks like when you've had a pond that was full of water and then you drain that water off. And that's actually the best scenario because um, as it drains off, a lot of the food is concentrated and it's expo it exposes mud and shallow water. Uh, and it's not full of vegetation. Shorebirds, I, I didn't mention this yet, but shorebirds, a lot of them kind of hate vegetation. They don't want to be crawling around with uh, shrubs and grasses around them. And, and the idea is that they really prefer a, a good line of sight where they can be watching for raptors, especially peregrine falcons and merlins and other raptors that might swoop in very fast uh, and, and hunt them. Uh, and uh, they're also adapted to finding food in these habitats. Um, so we get a lot better response of these shorebirds when we can create mud and shallow water without a bunch of vegetation. And the best way to do that is to have it be flooded for a while, which keeps the weeds out. Um, it keeps out the plants. And then when you take that water off, it's great habitat for at least a few weeks until that vegetation starts growing in. And then you can shift to another pond that, that, that wasn't in habitat before. And so you can kind of rotate around um, and sort of chase that open water. It's, it's ephemeral though, and it doesn't, doesn't last forever. And you have to really actively work to create it. If you just let these, these ponds fill in naturally with, with uh, um, what would happen um, through, through natural processes, they, they will get filled in with vegetation eventually and they're not good shorebird habitat. Um, this is another example from just a few weeks ago. In fact, uh, I think it was late April. And our farmer 
uh, our, our landowner there, I should say, um, just announced to me that he had been making spring shorebird habitat. And we, we weren't paying him to do this. Uh, he just enjoys it so much and knows that there's a need for it. And he created this, this was about a 40 acre pond. Ultimately, it's hard to see the acreage here. Um, but it, um, in fact, let's see. Uh, it's one of the ponds on the top right there. It's um, hard to tell which one. And um, this, this, uh, we were, this was a great surprise. We had a field trip coming up and he uh, told us that he had great shorebird habitat and we were able to show people eight or nine different species. We have both greater and lesser yellow legs out there and then quite a, quite a few long-billed dowagers. Those are the three most prominent species. And there were stilt sandpipers in there and least and semi-palmated sandpipers and a, a few other things along with blue-winged teal, which um, blue-winged teal just love the same kind of habitat as a lot of these shorebirds. So we're often making teal habitat at the same time. So that's a really a success story um, in that the, the landowners are really, it's really happening how we, we envisioned, which is that the landowners are falling in love with it as well. So that, you know, God forbid, when, when Delta Windbergs can't any longer afford to pay these guys to do this, um, they'll, steep, they'll keep doing it and they'll teach their, their children how to do it as well because it's part of their, what they do. Um, we also bring field trips to these sites. This site is near Sky Lake, uh, which I'll tell you more about in a minute. And we often bring them to Four Winds Refuge here and teach people how to, uh, how to identify shorebirds and talk to them about their migration and their habitat. Um, on the other hand, uh, a more recent initiative on our side in working uh, with landowners is trying to create shorebird habitat on what we call working lands um, and more specifically crop uh, farms. So this is a, an aerial photo from a drone photo of um, uh, a farm near Indianola, Mississippi that has, uh, they, he, this is James Failing's farm and he, he grows corn and soybeans primarily in a, in a rotation. And this started because we were asking a few years ago, we wanted to branch out into not just working with duck hunters and those kinds of properties, but also uh, start doing more in croplands because there's so much potential, uh, so much acreage, but we wanted to be able to do it without pumping groundwater. And, um, you know, it, might, it surprises a lot of people to learn that there is actually a groundwater crisis that is starting to, to um, emerge in the Delta uh, due to um, high impact from groundwater wells from agriculture. Uh, the, there's a cone of depression in the aquifer that is increasing. And we uh, felt that it was important to try to develop strategies for making wildlife habitat that didn't contribute to that problem. So we settled on focusing at first on working with farmers who have what's called a tailwater recovery system. So you can see in the back, uh, the, that narrow pond back there by the tree line, there's a couple of them. Those are reservoirs where the water that drains off of these agricultural fields flows into ditches and then flows towards those reservoirs and then is pumped into those reservoirs to save that water for subsequent irrigation. So that farmer can reuse that water for irrigation multiple times during the summer. And then in the fall, they often have leftover water in those irrigation ponds, in those uh, tailwater ponds. And so we approached this farmer about what if you, after you harvest your crop of corn, in, in late August, early September, can we pay you to uh, just pump that, uh, that water back out onto those fields and make shallow water and mud? And we'll see if we attract shorebirds. And, um, and, it, and it worked really well. Uh, this farmer was willing to try it and it wasn't too difficult for him, although there, it's, not, um, it's a hard time of year to do something that you're not planning to do because the, those farmers are busy with their harvests. And, taking time out to make bird habitat is not, not really on their agenda. Um, but he's been really great to work with and it's, it's, it worked out really well. Um, and we conducted a preliminary study there for three years uh, looking at um, tailwater flooding after corn harvest. And this is all in Sunflower County in, in Mississippi. And at each site, we had three flooded fields and three unflooded fields so that we could compare uh, the bird abundances and also a variety of other things uh, that I'll tell you more about in a minute. And our overarching hypothesis eventually became that these temporary wetlands on crop fields may benefit not only wildlife, but may have some benefits for 
farms and ecosystems as well. Um, and this is because of some things we started to see as we kept doing this. Um, so bird habitat was the first goal, but it became clear that when you ask a farmer to hold water on these plots, uh, there are potential soil conservation benefits as well, because just to hold this water, they have to put uh, boards in their water control structures and prevent water from running off. And that slows the flow of water off of these fields, which reduces erosion and keeps, keeps soil on the field. Secondly, um, uh, we hypothesized that there would be benefits for denitrification. And I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a minute, but that's a, an ecosystem benefit that wetlands provide. Um, but just to go back a minute, when we started talking with farmers about trying to do this, um, we heard a lot of concerns from, from them. Uh, and I, I thought it might be interesting to list them here because uh, to make it clear that it's not so easy to just approach a farmer and ask them to do this. Um, uh, as I mentioned already, this fall flooding takes time away from their normal activities of harvest and, and field prep. They prep their fields in the fall for spring planting. Um, it, uh, there was concerns from farmers that it would, uh, flooding their fields in the winter would, in the fall and, and winter would erode their beds that they've just created for their spring planting. Um, it, it might cause the stubble from the corn to drift and interfere with planting in the spring. Um, it might cause delays getting into their fields in the spring because the fields are wet, uh, wetter than they would be otherwise. Some were concerned with hardening of soil after flooding, which might impede planting or reduce crop yield. Um, and then a big concern was that it would decrease nutrient availability, especially phosphorus. And, and we heard this term a lot, that the flooding causes you, it locks up your phosphorus, reducing your crop yield. So, you know, we were concerned that, that some of these problems would be too great for, for farmers to overcome and that they they wouldn't, they just wouldn't want to do these things and it wouldn't be worth it. And if it's not worth it to the farmer, then ultimately this isn't a practice that's going to have legs. So, um, oh, oh, and just to give you a little background, this, um, this locking up of phosphorus has some basis in, um, uh, well, the, the Mississippi State Soil and Nutrient, uh, Soil and Plant Nutrient Lab was telling people, telling farmers uh, that they may have um, nutrient deficiencies after flooding, especially severe phosphorus deficiency after transition from a flooded environment. Um, this ties up phosphorus in a form unavailable for crop uptake. So, you know, this wasn't coming out of nowhere. The Mississippi State was telling farmers this. Um, there's some evidence uh, for phosphorus deficiency after some floods in 1993 in the Midwest. And so that's partly where this was coming from. Um, also, there was a study done up in, um, in Stoneville, Mississippi, where the, there's a uh, Mississippi State extension uh, research, uh, research plots, and they were studying rice fields. These were small plots uh, of rice, but um, they found that groundwater flooding, they were using groundwater, not surface water like we are, um, but you know, doing that in the fall and winter, it had some benefits of helping the decomposition to speed up and controlling weeds, but it also did, they saw evidence of reduced subsequent soybean yield in those, in those fields. Um, but they really weren't sure why. Um, you know, was it phosphorus? Was it nitrogen? Is it some kind of allelopathy from the rice straw? Um, a lot of speculation and no, no data on the mechanism. So with that background, you know, we set out on our project first to quantify bird usage and make sure that birds were using these, um, uh, these sites. And, and indeed they were. We had great response from lots of species. I've, I've shown the uh, the, I guess the five most common are in the graph on the right there, long-billed dowager, least sandpiper, lesser yellow legs, greater yellow legs, and killdeer. Um, and, you know, on the order of thousands of birds on the flooded fields and, and uh, barely any on the dry fields, this is maybe not surprising to those of you who know um, what, you know, what these birds' habits are. But it was pretty neat to see, and it, it's amazing how fast it happens. The farmer was called me the day after he flooded and said, we've already got birds down here. And he had uh, kill D, he said, dropping out of the sky um, within within hours even. And, and then within days, it was things like lesser yellow legs and sandpipers were finding it um, very quickly. So that was really gratifying. It was working. And we suspect, and we haven't tested this yet by comparing, but we suspect that the habitat is a little bit higher quality, a little bit quicker with this surface water 
because it's already pre-inoculated with invertebrates um, and their, um, their, prop their propagules. Um, whereas if you pump with groundwater, it's cold and it's also um, fairly dead and it takes a while for that to become a functional wetland. With this surface water, it's already got um, nutrients and, and invertebrates in it. And um, pretty quickly we were seeing good responses of birds. Um, but I should say now, part of the reason we started hypothesizing about other potential benefits of these temporary wetlands is, is, was because of conversations with this guy, who Jason Taylor, who's a scientist at the USDA ARS lab here in Oxford. He also happens to be my neighbor, and this was literally a conversation around a, a, a fire pit um, during, during COVID, um, kind of at the beginning. And he was hypothesizing that um, holding surface water like this would have additional benefits, especially denitrification and sediment retention. And I told you that I would explain denitrification. That's a, a bacterial uh, process where uh, that tends to happen in lower oxygen environments where bacteria take um, uh, ionic forms of nitrogen like nitrate and ammonium, and that ends up getting converted into gaseous nitrogen that is in the air. And they get a little bit of energy out of that. And what happens as a net result is excess nitrogen in the water gets taken out of the water and gassed off into the air. And that's this is considered good uh, from a pollution perspective because that nitrogen then doesn't go downstream when that water eventually runs off. It doesn't go into the streams and rivers and ultimately to the Gulf of Mexico where nitrogen, excess nitrogen can cause uh, harmful algal blooms and oxygen depletion and contribute to this dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So the EPA and others are trying to reduce nitrogen runoff from agricultural fields for this reason. So if we can get bacteria to do some of this this, this job, uh, pulling nitrogen out, all the better. Um, and this is something that happens in natural wetlands. It's one of the benefits of natural wetlands. So does it happen in a meaningful way in these temporary wetlands on agricultural fields? Um, so Jason and his team set out to measure uh, those things. We also collected samples of the macroinvertebrates from the habitat to see um, how the food of the shorebirds was doing in these different treatments. Um, and so those, the fall of 2019 and 2020, we quantified all of those things, sediment runoff, denitrification, bird and macroinvertebrate densities. And then we got data on, from the farmer on subsequent crop yield. And it was really exciting to see the data come out of this, uh, this study. Denitrification, for example, was really quite substantial. Um, it added up cumulatively over the course of the fall to about 40 pounds per acre of nitrogen, which is roughly half of the nitrogen that the farmer puts on there every year. Uh, and uh, that's quite a lot of nitrogen to be pulling off of these fields. Um, and uh, secondly, it was really clear that we were saving a lot of soil. Um, uh, if you look at the two jars there, the jar on the right is from is a runoff sample from a, from a field that was not flooded, but right after a rain event, a storm event. And you can see how full of sediment that water is. On the left is water that we caught off of a field that had been flooded. Um, this was after a rainstorm event and it's much clearer and contains a lot less soil. So this is saving on the order of millimeters of soil every year if you're, if you're holding water on your fields. Um, and these red, um, the red samples here are the, from the unflooded fields and that's the amount of sediment in those samples on the vertical axis there. Um, so it's working. It was working for denitrification. It was working for sediment retention. Um, a really nice, pleasant surprise was when we got the yield results from the farmer the next year. And he reported that um, in each of those two years, he saw about a four or 5% increase in subsequent soybean yield on those uh, fields that had been previously flooded compared to the fields that had not been flooded. And this was, this was, I was ecstatic about this, honestly, because we have been hoping for at least just to break even on, the, on yield. Just, uh, if we could just show farmers that there's no detriment to your crop yield, then there's all these other benefits that, that might be worth it. Well, if the farmer's actually getting a little bit of a yield bump, and four to 5% for a farmer, you know, they, they are working on the margins and, and that, that makes a difference. This farmer told me that that's meaningful to him to get a four or 5% increase in yield. Um, so we were really excited about that. And that gave us a lot of optimism about potentially uh, being able to uh, 
um, promote these practices um, uh, for wildlife and other benefits. But on the other hand, we had a lot of questions. Um, uh, when we do this, for example, are these yield benefits consistent um, among years, among sites? And if so, what is the mechanism? Why is there a yield increase? Is it, is it increased soil health? And, and if so, what aspect of soil? Um, what are the effects on soil exactly? What are the effects of flood timing? So if we flood only in the fall, which is maybe the most beneficial for shorebirds and for denitrification because it's warm and the bacteria are active, or if we flood in the winter, which is more beneficial for ducks, uh, but not for much else, uh, uh, then you know, are, what are the relative benefits of that? Um, and also, what does it matter if we do this after corn versus soybeans and vice versa? So with those questions and our data uh, that I already showed you, we applied to the EPA's Gulf of Mexico Farmer to Farmer grant program, and we received a grant from them that started this past year uh, to study these phenomena and to answer those questions uh, that I posed on the former slide, on the previous slide. So this is a partnership with the University of Mississippi, with the USDA uh, Research Lab, with Mississippi State University and Extension, and with Delta Windbirds. Uh, we last year worked on four farm sites in the Sunflower River Basin, expanding uh, these studies to multiple sites. And this year we're going to try to work at 10 sites uh, across the Delta. Um, last year we used five whole field treatments at each site. We had a control unflooded field, a passive flood field, which is just riser boards holding rainfall in, but not actually actively putting water on. And then we had a fall flood, a winter flood, and a fall plus winter. Uh, and we're still working on analyzing the data from that study, uh, but I'll tell you that it was highly variable among the four farm sites, whether we saw um, uh, invertebrates in the soil in, in big numbers and whether the birds were there. And that seemed to have to do especially with tillage practices where uh, one farm that had really intensive uh, plowing didn't have nearly the bird response, even though the habitat looked pretty good. Another farm that we worked at the soil was too sandy and the water, we couldn't get water to hold on there. So the water kept draining off. And so we're, we're learning a lot about just the practicalities of, of applying these kinds of treatments. Um, and this year we're, we're gonna expand to 10 farms to hope to capture more of that natural variability among farms. Um, and this will be going on for three years and we're, we're focusing on corn and soybean rotations. Uh, we're also conducting farmer outreach events, trying to get farmers talking about these flooding practices. What are their experiences, positive and negative, and then showing them our data to show them that there is some promise here. And eventually the goal is to have a network of farmers that are engaged in this practice and talking to each other about it. Uh, so um, here's an example of one of our research sites. Uh, just to show you what it looked like last fall, this is at um, a farm near Sunflower, uh, in Sunflower County. There was one field that had a winter flood, one that was a dry control. There's a fall winter, there's the fall flood, and this one had boards only. That was our dry control. And there's the tailwater reservoir right there. Um, just to show you some of the characters involved in this study going forward, um, this is my current master's student, Emma Counts, who is really the bird person on this project now. She's um, focusing on doing all the bird counting to quantify shorebird and waterfowl responses to these treatments. And so she was out there uh, at each of these sites every two weeks through uh, from, from September through January. And on her final field day out there, she had, uh, I should have put a photo in, but um, she told, she sent me a, a photo that a friend of hers took of least sandpipers actually foraging on the ice in the Delta. So there were, there was something they were picking off the surface of the, of the frozen uh, agricultural field and that was the final field day. Um, so she's a tough, um, uh, a tough field biologist and doing awesome work. Um, she's also helping to quantify the macroinvertebrates in the, in the soils and will be using that to help understand the usage uh, of these fields by birds. She's also helping us um, we're, we're, uh, with the shorebird tagging project that I'll mention here in a few minutes. Uh, because that data will really um, help her with her data analyses. Um, this is Victoria Simic, who is also a graduate student of mine on this project. And uh, Victoria is actually, sh she's shown here installing um, depth sensor 
Uh, she works full time at the USDA and for, with Jason Taylor, but also is starting a master's program. And she's going to be looking at the role of amphibians in these systems, actually, in these temporary wetlands. Uh, they're how they respond and especially how they may affect nutrient cycling in these agricultural wetlands. Um, and then I, I mentioned this sh Delta Shorebird tagging project. So this is a new thing that we just kicked off this past winter. Uh, uh, on the left is Hal Mitchell installing a modus tower on the top of these grain bins. And um, uh, this is our team in January making kind of a dry run, but it was not dry. It was quite muddy and very, very cold and about 20 mile an hour winds. Uh, super, probably the most difficult field conditions I've ever actually engaged in. Um, and uh, we kind of did a preliminary test to see about our methods for catching shorebirds at these sites. And we didn't catch any birds uh, because everything was frozen over and muddy, um, but uh, we're well prepared now for this fall catching. Um, and we're gonna especially focus on sort of medium-sized shorebirds like Dunlin and long-billed dowagers and snipe uh, and um, a, a few other species in that size range uh, because a lot of them, uh, we don't have good information, especially for how long are they staying in the Mississippi Delta? This is a big question that really impacts how we analyze our data because if Emma goes out there every two weeks and she sees a flock of least sandpipers, is it the same birds or is it a different, a whole new bird, group of birds? We don't actually know. Uh, probably it's different birds with least sandpiper in the fall, but what about in the winter? Do they really turn over as fast in January from week to week? Probably not. Uh, and how does that change from fall into winter at these sites? So we're going to try to answer that by gluing uh, radio transmitters to the backs of a bunch of these shorebirds um, and then picking up their signals uh, around the, the delta uh, as they move around. So um, uh, stay tuned for results from that. Um, maybe in a couple of years, I can come back and talk about how that turned out. Um, so overall, I've already talked about one and two, and I'll just briefly finish by touching on uh, the last couple of aspects of Delta Windbirds activities, um, which is protection of wetlands and outreach and education. Um, habitat protection is mainly, uh, at, we've engaged in this at a site called Sky Lake in Humphreys County. This is a natural oxbow lake, which was part of the Mississippi River until about 4,000 years ago. And it's one of the only places in Mississippi that's left that has old growth bald cypress trees. It's a little hard to tell here, but this is about a 1500 year old bald cypress tree that is really gigantic and you can walk a boardwalk to see it. Um, but the lake itself is really amazing, this, this Oxbow Lake, and we've seen it hosting thousands of shorebirds and spoonbills and, 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 uh, and egrets and herons. And there's no, there wasn't any public access to that, to see that phenomenon until we purchased this property surrounded in yellow here and turned it into the, what we call the Delta Windbird Sky Lake Nature Reserve. And um, sometimes it's mud flats full of shorebirds, and sometimes it's the water is up 15 feet higher and it's a place where you can only put in a canoe or a kayak. Uh, but either way, it's a beautiful place to visit to see this natural uh, wetland type of wetland that still occurs in the Mississippi Delta. Um, so we bring groups out there for outdoor recreation um, and education of all kinds. Um, we love bringing young people out there, especially talking about the value of wetlands, talking about the natural history and ecology and, bio, and, and biodiversity uh, of those sites. I need to plug in my laptop here before I run out of power before the end of our talk. Um, so uh, uh, this is just a couple of images from field trips that we've been having out there. We also have, as you can see in the background, a prothonotary warbler nest box program uh, project out there that um, I'll mention a bit more about here in a second. So um, shown at the top is an example of student research. That's also an important mission of the reserve. These are two university students that are studying here the fungi of this site. There's not actually not very much known about the fungi of bottomland hardwood forests, especially the mycorrhizal fungi on the roots of the trees. And so we're sampling tree roots here to identify the mycorrhizal fungi. And at the bottom here is shown um, our student intern, Nora, who is a, a high school student in Oxford, and her mother, Meredith, uh, checking um, a prothonotary warbler nest box. Uh, this was part of the terms of the grant we got to buy this property was that we would put up prothonotary warbler nest boxes. And Jackson Audubon, including Charlie, uh, graciously helped us get started with a lot of advice and providing some boxes. Um, that was October of 
2020, I believe that we put those boxes up and then we monitored them in 2021 and we're ongoing, uh, ongoing still monitoring them now. And we've had really good success with the birds using them. And it's been a great learning experience for Nora, uh, who is uh, launching a career in bird conservation, uh, we, we hope. And um, it's really gotten her, given her a very concrete thing to work on and get very excited about. And it's really been great for outreach and, and getting people interested in our in these in these habitats. The prothonotary warbler is really a great ambassador species for um, uh, forested wetlands. Um, we also uh, try to promote ecotourism. We bring as much business as we can to uh, small businesses near these sites. For example, on the bottom left is Jerry, who um, uh, is a great cook, and her restaurant in Belzona is a, a frequent stop. Um, for Delta Windbirds participants in field trips, and we often get catering from her as well. Uh, we're also working on a, a mural project uh, to uh, kick off what we hope will be a series of nature-oriented and bird-oriented murals on walls in the Delta. And our vision is to create a bit of a, a type of nature or even bird-focused mural trail that can be a tourist attraction for small Delta towns. Um, who, where people will want to come and see uh, original artwork and learn about uh, the wildlife of the Delta. Um, uh, lastly, I want to mention a cool thing that's happening right now. Some of you may be aware of this organization called Bird Collective. Um, it's a cool group of people that are birders in New York that, um, and artists and writers and um, designers who got together and said they wanted to do something for bird conservation. And they put their heads together and started a business where they partner with a, a single nonprofit at a time and they create a collection of clothing and other aspects of other, other pieces of apparel on the theme of that nonprofit and then uh, sell those items. And then 20% of the proceeds goes to the nonprofit for, for bird and habitat conservation. And, this spring, Delta Windbirds, our organization, is the partner organization with Bird Collective. So uh, they have a they did a great job designing this amazing collection of shirts and hats and stickers and patches and um, mugs and really cool stuff that is all inspired by the the wetlands and the birds of the Mississippi Delta. Uh, so there's the great blue heron design on the left there. There's a cypress swamp uh, t-shirt on the bottom right that's been really popular and. Um, uh, and there's there's at least one shirt that is actually stained with Mississippi mud. Um, a couple of artists were involved in uh, from from Mississippi were involved in designing some of the shirts. There's a really popular uh, 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 roseate spoonbill design. So you can go there and and you can also read. There's a, a really nice article that they did about Delta Windbirds on their website with beautiful bird photography from um, uh, University of Mississippi. Professor Mark Dolan illustrating it. So check that out. And it's a it's actually really fun, I think, to have an option to buy gifts for relatives and friends that um, will support bird conservation and um, promote nature uh, at the same time. Um, so Bird Collective, check it out. Uh, that's all I have for you. I want to point you that, uh, to our website if you want to learn more about what Delta Windbirds does, deltawindbirds.org. Um, that's an email address if you want to write me with questions or comments or um, uh, anything else. We are on Facebook and Instagram and pretty easy to find in those places. So please follow us and watch for updates. We, in the summer, we try to post uh, prothonotary warbler updates on, on those forums and with video or photos of what's going on with those birds. So that's a neat place to see that. Um, and I am Jason Hooksma. Feel free to contact me anytime with questions um, or uh, anything else. Um, thanks for your attention, and if we have time, I'd be happy to answer any questions that folks might have.